tonight is one of those webinars where I get to sit back and the team do as well. We all get to sit back and simply learn. Um, and so I've got my notebook ready to make some notes. Um, and tonight's going to be led for us by Richard, who um, actually came to, I can't remember the number webinar, but came to the recording webinar, the record keeping webinar, and was one of our panel guests. Um, but we only gave you 10 minutes at that, Richard, didn't we? And then we were like, oh, we really want Richard to come back because it was so good and he had so many ideas. And I was just saying before we started to Richard how much I've used what he shared in his um, in his bit of the record keeping webinar. So thank you, Dave. Dave is saying it was number 43. Thank you very much for that. So we invited Richard back um, and actually... Um, Richard gave us a couple of topics to choose from and the team felt that um, social work and conflict and how it related into relationship based practice and was something that you felt I think guys didn't you that you felt maybe it wasn't covered as much at university and you wanted to think about this and it was something you'd really want to explore and so uh, Richard agreed to put tonight together for us so and I have had the pleasure of seeing the slides and looking through the slides so I know we are in for a real treat tonight and I am just going to go on mute now. I'm going to sit back. I'm going to let Richard introduce himself and introduce the whole topic and take us through the night. Thanks, Siobhan, and the, the rest of the team. That was a, a lovely introduction. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about conflict in social work um, and uh, especially in, in child protection social work, conflict is common and unavoidable. And it kind of sounds obvious, but... Um, any endeavour to work constructively with children and families must acknowledge this reality. But in my experience, there's relatively little attention given to conflict within social work. And so we can sometimes find ourselves bereft of ideas and tools that help us navigate this kind of complex aspect of practice. Indeed, a lot of relationship based practice places considerable importance on the role of the self as a means to successfully create relationships that have a positive impact on the lives of children and families. And obviously, for the most part, I'm in favour of this, but, but much of the literature is drawn from fields outside of social work, such as psychotherapy and counselling, where there are fundamental and, and in my opinion, uh, irre irreconcilable differences. Um, to, 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 to just give you two, the, one of the key differences is that many of the relationships in child protection and in other areas of social work are involuntary, not, not always, but often. And secondly, we often don't have the time to cultivate relationships to the degree that some of the other professions are able to. Um, and I think if we're not careful and we buy into the idea that we are responsible uh, to use our relationships in ways that um, create change and then we fail to do that we can be we can internalize feelings of incompetence or inadequacy um, so what I hope to do is um, explore some of the causes in, of conflict in social work and share some ideas and techniques that I've acquired in practice over the last decade for, for how to reduce conflict and then how to ameliorate the effects of conflict when it emerges um, th there's a couple of caveats before I begin the, the first is that um, you're not going to be able to avoid conflict altogether. That, that, that it's kind of built into the nature of the work that we do. And so it's, it, it's important to recognise that there's always going to be some element of it. And then, and then the, the, the second point I'd like to make before I get going is that the, these are just some of the ideas that I've learned and that I've acquired. And I'm sure there's lots of others that I haven't been exposed to or that I'm not aware of. So, so that I, I want to kind of invoke some humility, really, in about it, about what I'm about to say, and I'd really welcome the um, any kind of feedback or ideas after this about what you agreed with, what you didn't disagree with, and whether there's any other um, ideas that I haven't be heard about or thought about. Um, so, I'm going to briefly talk about a, a story about my dad. Um, and the reason why I want to speak about this is because I think his, his story and his experiences um, shed light on some of the uh, issues that we'll subsequently go on to, to, to talk about. Um, so let me just move to the next slide. 
So when, at some point in my dad's life, he was in a rehabilitation centre and part of his um, recovery in rehab was that he had to write a life story. And so this is an account of his life wrote by him. Now, my dad isn't alive. He died when I was 16 years old. Um, and so this has been quite, uh, and I didn't see this until a few years ago. So it's provided me a lot of insight into his experiences that I wouldn't have otherwise had. Um, so I'll just talk a little bit, I'll, I'll read this out and we'll go through different stages of in his life. So we, the children, were all in the front room. I believe I was about eight. Billy, my eldest brother, opened the door and in came a load of police, social worker and someone with a flash camera. Immediately, I ran under the cubby hole in absolute terror. Someone reached out there, reached out their hand in to get me and I bit him or her. Eventually, I was dragged out and we were all, and we were all photographed. I was temporarily put in the foster home. I went through a series of homes, changed schools 28 times. Eventually, it was decided that we'd be sent to an orphanage home run by nuns. I was abused by a worker there who used a knife. And so my dad, um, along with his several siblings, were um, removed from his father. His, his mother had already left, so he'd experienced the abandonment of his mum. And then his dad, for various different reasons, wasn't able to look after him. He was brought into care and then he was kind of separated from his different siblings and they went into different places. And he really didn't have any kind of stability, placement stability during, during his childhood. Um, and what, what's, what I found interesting when I was reading this was the, his experience, his kind of subjective experience of what it was like to be removed, because often when you're a social worker and you're involved in that process, it's conceptualized as a child protective um, uh, endeavor in some sense. You're removing children from families that are unsafe and trying to put them into, hopefully, into safer homes. And, and although that's quite an extreme um, option that we resort to, um, it, we, you can sometimes overlook how frightening and distressing that is for the children involved. Um, so he um, eventually, he grew up in Scotland, actually, and then he ended up down in Manchester, where he met my mum when he was about 16 or 17. And um, they had two children in a very short space of time, my eldest brother, my eldest sister, and they, um, and he was, began using drugs and was engaged in criminal behaviour um, throughout his 20s. And this is a, a description of his, his kind of, um, his drug use. One night, I went to score dope with a mate, but the dealer didn't have anything but morphine. I had a phobia around injections, but I went ahead and let him give me a fit. As soon as the rush came on, I fell in love with it. My wife had a sense of relief because I stopped drinking and fixed gear. This seemed my cure for my temper. And so often we um, conceptualise dr drug addiction or substance misuse as a, as a problem but, but in many instances, and certainly in my father's instance, it was a, it was a solution to a, a, an underlying problem. It was his attempt to, to deal with his psychological distress associated with his past experiences. Um, but also it seemed to function in the relationship with my mum in that it, it regulated his, man, his anger, which was also a consequence of his childhood. And I'm not, I'm not trying to minimise or um, underplay the negative aspects of my dad's behaviour, but it's trying to put a context to how these how these difficulties emerge. Um, and I also find the description of falling in love an interesting one, um, be because it's actually um, there's some research by the likes of Yak Pangseth, and they they would describe it, the use of heroin or opiates as as a similar process in terms of what it is to be in love with somebody. Um, and when I've worked with parents who've misused uh, heroin and uh, um, one of the things that if you ask them what what do you kind of get out of the substances what is it that it gives you I've, I've heard this a few times they'll they'll say it's like an internal warm hug and so you get a sense of what it is that they're they're able to acquire from the drug it's it's comfort and it's affection and it's and it's an emotional warmth and for some people they don't have access to that in any other area of their life Plus, they have this unbearable psychological distress that they're trying to, to, to tolerate and to deal with. So drugs becomes the most obvious and immediate uh, solution. 
Um, um, so he lived, he lived like that for a good 15 to 20 years. And um, my, they went on to have two, two more children. And then I was the youngest of five. And then here he talks about his, um, his recovery. Um, and he writes here, I attended the birth and held my wife's hand as he was born, stone cold sober and with some sobriety in, in me. He was the only child born while I wasn't actively addicted. I was engaging in my meetings. I followed the steps through, always with step one and step three at the foundation. I worked in a night shelter, went to a part-time education for three years, got a place at Bristol University and got a diploma. I started working. I felt ordinary after about eight years. So the, the there's two pictures there. One of them is of Bristol University and the second is of um, some social work offices in Bristol because my dad was a when, when he did get clean was a child protection social worker so the first several years of my life he was um abstinent from all drugs and alcohol and he he was also a social worker and he um and i've kind of tried to emulate in that in, in, in that because i'm also a social worker and, and at that point he was a kind of role model to, to, to me and when i was about 16 it, it was either before he died or shortly after, I was asking my mum about, do you know why he wanted to do social work? And one of the things that she told me was that he wanted to stop what had happened to him from happening to others. And when I heard that, um, uh, I, I kind of felt an, uh, an impulse or a desire to help at what, what had happened. I, I kind of wanted to join him on that endeavor in some sense. Like I wanted to um, help him in that journey of helping others so that he felt like to continue the legacy in some kind of sense. And it wasn't until a, a few years ago when I was at a social work conference that I kind of made sense of that. And it was with a, there was a psychotherapist in the conference. And one of the things that he talked about is that those in the helping profession are often attempting to rescue their former childhood selves vicariously through others. And that kind of really illuminated what my dad was doing in some sense. And, um, and so that, that, that was where he was for, for the first several years of my life. And then he unfortunately uh, relapsed and he, he writes here, um, I gradually stopped going to meetings. My wife was diagnosed with hep C and almost died. Then I was tested as I had noticed I was getting extreme tiredness. At first I put this down to aging. My workload was never ended. I used to go in at 7 a.m. and work till 10, 11, eventually retired on health grounds. It was shortly after I left my job, I took one pill and within a short time, I was a fully fledged alky and druggy. My son, Richard, saw some of the old behavior that he had never experienced before. And I now feel it has contaminated him. This disgusts me. I knew what was coming next, more fucking damage to Angela and my kids, Angela being my mum. And this kind of um, illustrates the, the challenge in overcoming childhood adversity. Um, he, because at a point when his life became difficult, he um, he gave up work and, and very quickly succumbed to old coping strategies that had helped him deal with the with with the distress. Um, and what what I would have never realised if I hadn't had had access to this diary was the fact that he felt that his behaviour and his relapse into drug use contaminated the relationship, and that that he felt disgusted by this. Now, at the point he was writing this, because um, he relapsed and then he tried to go to rehab a couple more times, then he developed cancer and then died when I was 16. Um, and when he died, he was actually clean, but for not very long. And so this was wrote uh, at some point when I was about 14 or 15 and he was in rehab and, and, and clean. Um, but, but he talks about that, the, that this disgusts me. And that's interesting because it's in present tense. And so um, it's not this disgusted me. So there's a sense that he's actively struggling with the, um, the, the shame and the um, emotional distress with, the, with his relapse into, into, into drugs and alcohol. Um, 
And it might be hard to see, but on the left hand side, or depending on how you're viewing it actually, um, there's the his handwriting. And when he gets to the point where he's writing about the relapse and the effect that it had on me and our relationship, it becomes slightly more incoherent and untidy. And that kind of indicates psychologically what, what he was experiencing. Um, now, the reason why I wanted to, to share that story about my dad is because I think it's significantly influenced my approach to trying to help families. And I often think about his experiences um, and what I would do as a social worker currently if I was to go in and try and help my, if I was to be my child's self social worker and I was to go in and try and help my dad. And I think I might end up, and, and bearing in mind, I'd have none of the backdrop. So I wouldn't have this narrative. I wouldn't have this story. All I'd be seeing is a, is a, a, is a drug addict dad um, and his son, and obviously my brothers and sisters and my mum who was depressed and, and the difficulties that he was experiencing. And I might be inclined to tell him, like, you know, you need to sort this out. And and that's clearly not going to work because he's because look at his childhood experiences and how traumatic they were. Um, I might suggest that he, he goes on a parenting course because, you know, the, the, the drug addiction was, was rendering him incapable of, you know, providing a routine and boundaries and um, regular meals and those type of activities. So I might see that he needs some help with that, not realising that if, if he could get help with the fundamental problem, the parenting issues would, would dissolve in some sense. Um, I might suggest that he accesses talking therapies where he gets six sessions. Um, uh, but but when, I, when I have access to the story in the way that I do now, I can see how woefully inadequate that might be. Um, and so there's lots of ways in which we try and help parents that, that don't necessarily correlate with the intensity of their needs. And, um, and so I suppose what I'm saying um, is that hopefully we'll talk about some of the ways that we can help families in more productive and, and, and helpful ways. Um, so um, there's, there's two fundamental misconceptions um, I think about social work and, and the first is that we uh, as social workers can make people change and unfortunately um, we simply can't and, and it might sound like an obvious point but I know especially when I was a newly qualified social worker I would place inordinate expectations on myself to try and make parents change and often what that would do would lead to me trying to tell parents directly what they needed to do and how they how they should fix their problem um, however telling parents what their problem is and how to fix it is rarely successful um, in fact it can even kind of increase resistance and make change less likely to happen and so when these attempts of just being direct and telling parents what the problem is um, we can become frustrated and, and begin to take the lack of progress personally um, the second misconception is that we can, through our relationships, um, form kind of therapeutic alliances that will facilitate change. Um, and it's kind of presupposed that through relationship based practice, we're trained of, to, to be able to have conversations or deliver interventions that facilitate change. And undoubtedly, this is desirable and perhaps a primary motivation for social workers entering the profession. In my experience, it's quite an unattainable um, and, uh, uh, ambition. And the reason for that is that we, we are in child protection a representative of a statutory organisation that is threatening to many parents. So anxiety, trust, uh, mistrust and fear Kind of whilst understandable responses to our involvement causes tension and friction and breeds hostile ground for for building relationships to to make a difference this was encapsulated in um in the case for change recently um that was published by josh McAllister as part of the review into children's social care via this quote of lady hale who was one of the key um contributors to the children act she she wrote the aspiration of developing a partnership between children's services and families with children in need proved very difficult to achieve. 
The trouble is that if efforts to work with families run into difficulties, the local authority can always resort to care proceedings and the families know that. And so in addition to being feared by, by many families, whether that even despite often our best efforts to try and alleviate those fears and convey our desire to work in collaboration with them, parents are still still hold on to that perception that we can easily and readily remove their children. Um, so in addition to that kind of fear, we're also considerably bound by the amount of time that we have. And so when you look at the uh, research around um, what, what contributes to a relationship being therapeutic and leading to change. There's two, two key ingredients, two evidential ingredients. The first is psychological safety and the second is time. And, and I think um, the, the, the role of the statutory social worker deprives us of those two necessary ingredients. Now, this might sound like uh, uh, I'm being somewhat futile, but I think if we recognise these limitations, that's the first step to reducing some of the conflict. Um, at, at least it will reduce some of the internal conflict when these approaches aren't having the kind of effects that we can have. Um, but I also think that we can, there are lots of other ways that we can understand the, the difficulties that parents uh, and families experience and, and other ways in which we can facilitate change. And that's what I'm going to hopefully um, um, talk about today. So there's three areas that I'm going to explore um, that I think are, are key ingredients in reducing conflict and fundamentally being uh, useful and helpful to children and families. Um, so the first is principles for conceptualizing parental difficulties. The second is working with denial and identify, and I conceptualize two types of denial, the situational denial and psychological denial. And then the third area is how we help families. Um, so the, these kind of, I'm going to share two core principles that, that I've kind of developed and refined over the last decade or so. And I believe that, that when these ideas are implemented successfully, they significantly reduce the probability of conflict emerging and create space for a different kind of dialogue to unfold. Um, and, and what I like about these ideas is they're not kind of um, contingent upon having a certain set of communication skills or, or being in a, or having a particular practice framework. So this kind of means that they can be integrated into our practice, whether we're a student social worker or an experienced practitioner. And it means that we can utilize them whether we're in a local authority that has signs of safety or a local authority that has adopted systemic practice. Um, and this is kind of echoed in this Rogers quote about the attitudes and the feelings rather than the, the theoretical orientation or the practice model is what's important. Um, oh, I seem to, uh, sorry, it's jumping about a bit. So two key principles. So the first one is by a spiritual teacher named Eckhart Tolle, and it's if her past be your past, her pain, your pain, her level of consciousness, your level of consciousness, then you would think and act exactly as she does. With this realization comes forgiveness, compassion, and peace. Now, I think that's probably a principle that under, underpins the belief system of many professionals who work in the, in the health and social care profession. But what if that her that Eckhart Tolle refers to is Victoria Kalimbe's aunt who emotionally and physically beat her niece to death? What if that her is Peter Connolly's mother, whose actions resulted in the death of her son following weeks of extreme neglect and abuse, or Daniel Pelka's mother and stepfather who attempted to drown him and starved him to death. Extending compassion to those that harm children, intentionally or unintentionally, can be challenging because it feels like we're making the behavior acceptable or devaluing another, another person's perspective. In other words, it can sometimes feel like we're overlooking the harm that's done to children as a result of parents' actions. So therefore, how do we make sense of the actions of those who cause harm to children in ways 
that doesn't negate their harmful behaviour um, and facilitates compassion and more importantly, an understanding that facilitates a meaning, meaningful way forward. So, so first of all, I think that we have to admit that the division between us and them is, is an illusion in some sense. It's a, it's a construct. And if we've been brought up at the same time with the same experiences in the same family, within the same culture and society, in my opinion, there's an inevitable prob probability that we would think and act exactly as they do. And then following on from that, the, the second key principle um, is um, encapsulated here by Carl Rogers. Can we enter into the internal world of feelings and personal meaning so completely that we lose all desire to evaluate and judge it. Now, hopefully when I talked about my dad's experience and, and what his diary does is it gives a, a glimpse into his inner world, um, his own experiences of terror, of abandonment from his mother and the separation from his dad and his brothers and sisters and what that was like for him and the effect that the drug addiction had on, his, on, on our relationship. And maybe for a moment you, you lost the desire to evaluate and judge him um, negatively or harshly. So if we assume that the individual um, with their flaws and self-destructive behaviours are manifesting what we would manifest if we had their experiences, then we can begin to be curious about behaviour that seems unusual or troubling or self-destructive. And we can begin to ask non-judgmental questions, um, genuinely curious questions like what happened in your life where drugs and alcohol became an attractive option or a, a self-protective necessary part of your life? Um, Gabor Mate, who's, who's done a lot of work on addiction, says um, never ask why the addiction but why the pain? Um, we can ask questions like how do drugs and alcohol help you cope? What happened for you to feel compelled to, to con and compelled to control and coerce others to secure attention and love within intimate relationships? What happened for you to learn that displaying anger was better than showing sadness or fear or vulnerability? And in the absence of implicit or explicit kind of moral condemnation, parents can feel more confident in expressing some of their inner desires and, and their uh, motivation. Um, and so I think that positing these kind of questions increases the likelihood of facilitating their own ability to look at, look at some of these issues and some of their own internal mechanisms that drive some of the issues, um, but also some of their strength and their resilience and their courage. Um, See, when I began social work back in 2010, I, um, I was always interested in, about, in, in how people come to develop the problems that they come to develop. And maybe because of um, my experiences of growing up with my dad, I'd never conflated an individual's morality or intrinsic worth with their behaviour, um, even when that behaviour was objectively destructive for themselves or, or for others. Um, and so whether a parent was suffering from depression or severe anxiety, misused drugs or was controlling and coercive with their partner, I was intrigued into what they considered to be the benefits of such behaviour and, and importantly when that behaviour first emerged. And so for the latter question I was always kind of directed back to their childhood and once I had a better understanding that of, um, of the developmental and social context to which the behaviour emerged, then the behaviour that seemed on the face of it kind of irrational and destructive and incomprehensible made, made a lot of sense and, um, and often seemed rational and self-protective and comprehensible. Um, uh, I, I'll give you a, an example. Um, I went on a, a drive once with a young person, um, a teenager, and um, the young person had experienced a really challenging upbringing, considerable adversity, and had engaged in behaviour that had caused considerable harm to, 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 to another person, to, to a person younger than he was. 
Um, and because of this young person's behaviour and um, emotional behavioural presentation, terms such as um, dangerous, intimidating, violent and unpredictable and high, high risk and many other kind of alarming terms that would reflect concern about his functioning would use to describe him. And so um, I was driving one day and um, the young person was kind of rummaging through my glove box, which is not that uncommon when you have kids in the car. Um, it, you know, their, their, um, their curiosity or desire for distraction is still unsatisfied after pressing every other button in your car. So they end up in your glove box. And so inside the glove box, this young person found a, a CD and it was a read along storybook. Um, sorry about that. Um, uh, it was a read long storybook and it was aimed at children aged three to four and he was at least 10 years older um, and he put the CD in and the young person listened really attentively to this CD whilst following the pictures in the book and he repeated this again and again and at that at that point I saw a small child who needed desperately to be looked after and nurtured and offered care that would compensate for his early harmful experiences. And this young person would soon become an adult and probably a parent. And if, if he didn't self-protectively conceal all signs of vulnerability with anger and bravado, then we almost certainly would. As the terminology we were using to describe him would function to, dis to distort the lens from which we would view this person. And, and a, great deal of, a great deal of perception is projection. Um, and so we would lose sight that the same behavior that we considered dangerous was once uh, a kind of necessary and unavoidable attempt at protecting the self. And so this young person, um, if, if he was now an adult and perhaps a parent would still have those th that need to be looked after and to be nurtured and I think we can easily forget in our attempts to be child-centered that parents have needs as well um, how can we expect a parent to look after the child when nobody is looking after them and how can we expect a parent to empathize with their child when nobody's empathized with them and so I'm not saying that um, or suggesting that we overlook the potential risk a parent's behaviour might be, but I do think that we should at least endeavour to understand the origins of that behaviour. Um, and as I've already mentioned, I think behaviour that appears self-destructive or harmful or troubling or disturbed is usually, if not always, the manifestation of a coping strategy developed in childhood that's been unconsciously and, and erroneously carried forward into adulthood. Another way of putting this is it, it, that it reflects the person's kind of ingenuity and capacity to adapt to a previously harsh environment. Um, and so I think we should at least give them some credit for that, even if the, the, the continuation of that behaviour is causing themselves and other people um, harm and distress. Now, of course, following on from that, we need to support them, develop healthier, more adaptive ways of coping. Uh, and I think these two principles, when applied, will help you overcome some of the initial resistance and conflict that, that we encounter when we meet families. That genuine curiosity and desire to understand the underlying functions of some of their behaviour. Um, now, the second key area is denial. Um, and denial um, is incredibly common in, in, in child protection and kind of exists on a continuum from uh, you've got full acknowledgement on one end of the distribution and complete denial on the other end. And I think um, certainly I've been guilty of overlooking that there's many strong social and interactional pressures that make denial a compelling response. Um, and and um, we often get into a lot of dispute about um, being getting to the bottom of the truth and, and and some of that is necessary but we do we can get caught up in spending a lot of time on this um and i think it's important to um understand the underlying function of denial um siobhan often talks about the kind of the why the what and the how and often the the why is kind of being dropped off the the, the, 
the kind of radar in some sense. And I think, and, and I agree with her, that it is one of the most important questions that we could be asking as social workers. So why would somebody be compelled to engage in denial? Um, and I think there's probably two primary motivations. Firstly, many parents are really fearful of social work intervention, and they often overestimate the powers available to us um, in our ability to remove children. Um, and then in other cases where we are working with families subject to child protection or within pre-proceedings, then that potential and that fear gets amplified even further because there is there is some legitimacy behind that perceived risk. Um, and so some families can easily conclude that sharing the concerns or requesting for help may be used unfavourably against them. And so this can get us involved in disputes whereby the parents vehemently deny um, the concerns, um, or if they're kind of evidentially undeniable, or will minimise the issue um, and, and try and spend time. And we will then end up trying to spend our time um, attempting to prove and demonstrate how we're correct and how they're incorrect. And this is this type of denial is what I would refer to as situational uh, uh, denial. And I think there's, a, there's, there's four things that we can do to, to uh, counteract this tendency to get into these denial disputes. The first is, um, this is a quote by um, Stephen Covey in a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. It's such a good principle to, to, to live by. Demons, part of what we can do for parents is demonstrate empathy and understanding for their position. That doesn't mean that we need to necessarily agree with them, but we can at least take the time to understand their perspective and learn how they've come and how they form their views. And so this involves being suspending our own judgment for a moment and being curious and asking clarifying questions and summarising back to them our understanding in a way that really conveys to them that we've taken on board and listened to what it is that they're saying. And often, in my experience, this kind of interpersonal act in of itself softens the parents' denial and will, will create openness uh, to discussing some of their problems. Um, and then the second step is that we invite them into a conversation about some of the concerns the local authority might have. And so we can explain to them they don't need to agree with what the, the local authority's concerns are, but we're just trying to open a space where multiple perspectives can be considered. And then the third element is that we ask them about what they would like to happen. And often parents will, ask, will answer this question by saying they don't want social care involved. And we can agree with them that, on that. That's a mutual goal of ours. They don't want us in, involved in their life. And that's brilliant because we don't want to be unnecessarily involved in the lives of other people either. Um, and so then once we have that as a kind of mutual goal, we can begin a conversation about what can be done to alleviate some of the concerns that social care has. And then the, the fourth step is to explain to them clearly and transparently about the process for which we're working with and our expectations with regards to change and and what will happen in the event that change doesn't occur. And this isn't a kind of confrontational approach, it's, it's providing clarity about what they can expect um, from statutory input and providing them with an opportunity to, to make a choice. Um, so we can't make people do anything, but we can say to them, look, if you continue to engage with this type of behavior, we're still gonna be really worried about the effect that that's gonna be having on your child. And if we don't see change within a certain period of time, then we might have to consider um, go, you know, whether your child needs a child protection plan. And if, we, and if we think that your child needs a child protection plan, we think that they're kind of experiencing um, significant risk of harm. And now I know you, and we can say you don't need to agree with that, but we do need to be really clear and really transparent in, um, about what the implications are you know, should they take certain courses of action. The second type of denial is what I'll refer to as um, psychological denial. And Ian Thomas, who is a social worker and a, and a TEDx speaker, 
um, who we actually had a social work conference today at Baines and he was one of the speakers there. Exceptionally um, gifted individual and a very eloquent speaker. He talks about denial as a, as a psychological coping strategy designed to keep us emotionally stable in very unstable times. And so um, denial, in other words, it, um, of our internal and relational problems often functions self-protectively to conceal from the self aspects that cause shame. Um, and actually, I heard this really good um, quote today um, by Alicia, Alicia, Alicia Lee, who was also another speaker at the conference, and she was talking about how minimization and denial and blame are often manifestations of shame. Um, and so this form of denial is kind of most evident in addiction where a drug user or an alcoholic will vehemently deny um, that they have any kind of substance misuse problems, even when there's quite clear evidence to the contrary. Um, but but it's also it's also apparent in other problems that people experience. Um, and, and there's many aspects of our functioning that remain unconscious for which we remain unaware of, you know, whether that be being emotionally disconnected or anxious or insecure or coercive. And part of why they remain outside of our awareness and why we might be in denial about them is because they're often coping strategies developed in childhood and then they become habituated, psychologically embedded, and then we can and, and we become aware, unaware of their kind of existence in some sense. So the, the one thing that I've learned when, when facing this dilemma of psychological denial is that confronting the parent um, never works and consistently leads to the conversation becoming difficult. In other words, you almost certainly can create conflict. Um, and this can be especially challenging because we can experience a lot of sympathy for the child and, and, um, and we have duties and responsibilities towards that child, especially when we see that the child is suffering harm as a result of the parent's actions. Um, but also we're under a lot of pressure organisationally to identify risk and resolve or, or at least reduce the risk. Um, and so there is, a, there is an impulse, a strong impulse individually and organisationally to, to point out to parents directly and quickly how their behaviour is causing harm and, and what they need to do. But many behaviours that, that cause harm to the self or others are often... Um, ways of, of coping that uh, as I mentioned earlier with my dad that was the, the 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 use of the drugs and alcohol was an attempt for him to resolve the psychological distress associated with his earlier experiences um, so although if to, to give another example if a parent is who's misusing alcohol they, they are they'll often experience many other problems related to looking after their child um, and so they might, they might find it, um, so although they find it to be, they might find it the most effective way to, to, to cope with the, the loneliness or the emotional distress, um, but also the, the pain of recognising the harmful effects that the alcohol use might be having on their functioning and their parenting and children can sometimes be too much to, to tolerate. Um, and so to deal with this, some parents try to minimise or deny its effects to the, to the self or, or, or the effect that it has on others. So um, um, Gabor Mate talks about it's impossible to understand addiction without asking what relief the addict finds or hopes to find in the addictive behaviour. So if we can't confront them, well, I'm not saying you can't confront them, you can, and, and, um, but it just doesn't seem to create conversations that facilitate change. So if we can't do that, then what, what can we do? Um, and a really fascinating, and I think quite important finding that I'd only learned about quite recently, um, and this is consistent with my, my experience as well, as well, is that when you tell a parent what the problem is and how to fix it, it actively increases resistance. On the other hand, if you try and understand the reasons for the parent's difficulty, the resistance decreases and then we can begin to have a more fruitful conversation about change. Um, 
somebody said at this conference today that we're trying to form an alliance with the parts of the self that want to change. And I thought that's such a kind of powerful idea that, um, and, what, and one of the ways that we decrease resistance um, is about, is, is going back to listening about, um, so Carl Rogers again here talks about, we think we listen, but very rarely do we listen with a real understanding, true empathy. Yet listening of this very special kind is one of the most potent forces for change that I know. And so he's kind of encouraging a, a, a empathy, but, but I really like this definition of empathy being complex and demanding and strong yet subtle and a gentle way of being. Because empathy is kind of, it sounds nice and airy and very, but it's actually really challenging when you're confronted with a parent who, who on the face of it is seemingly so obviously hurting themselves and the people around them that you all you want to do is just tell them. And so it, it, empathy in that kind of context is demanding and does require some strength and subtlety. So, um, so the third area of, in terms of how we reduce conflict is how we um, conceptualize how we help families um, and this this um, illustration really changed the way I approached um, helping families when I came across it several years ago um, and this is in a book called Working with Denied Child Abuse by Andrew Tunnell who went on to develop Signs of Safety and Susie Essex um, and so um, th there's two ways to help people fundamentally um, the first is that you focus on the individual the, 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 the faulty light bulb. It may be that they have a drug addiction. It may be that they suffer severe mental health issues. It may be that they've got unresolved trauma that results in unexpected explosive incidences of violence. There may be multiple problems that the, 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 that the individual experiences and that we try to help them with. We send them to treatment, we send them to therapy. And that's a really important way that we try and help families. Um, and um, that, that's one way. And then the second way is that instead of focusing on r fixing the individual, you fix the system in and around the individual such that the risks that derive from the individual's behavior are mitigated against or ameliorated. Um, to, to, give you an, to give you an example, um, when I was about 12 or 13, we had a social worker come to our house and visited the family and I, I can't recollect at the time what the visit was about but at the time um, but retrospectively sorry um, I suspect it was linked to my dad's drug and alcohol use um, and I met this social worker who came around to the house and then she never returned to our house again but after she visited she'd completed a referral form to an organization called Young Carers because because at the time my mum was depressed and um, suffering with chronic fatigue syndrome. So, um, so I then went to Young Carers for four or five years um, and, and during that time I was able to access um, a weekly group setting, I used to have a one-to-one -one counselling, um, I used to go on to um, trips and then once I was 16 and too old to continue accessing the service, I was able to um, volunteer for them. And that volunteering was actually what helped with me apply to college a couple of years later. Now, this th what, what this social worker did, she didn't use her relationship skills. She didn't try to intervene with my dad. Um, and she didn't even change anything in relation to what my dad was doing. But it did, she was able to dramatically change my experiences of growing up in my house because I was given access to a wealth of support and experiences that made them considerably more manageable. She significantly increased the protective factors in my life and that social worker would have never known the impact that she'd made on my life and and sometimes when I'm frustrated with the bureaucratic demands of our role and cursing the fact that I have to fill out another bloody referral form I have to remind myself of this kind of experience and, and what it afforded me. 
So, um, so I think that we um, we we look to, to help the individual, and and um, and part of that is around matching um, the kind of the need that they present with with the appropriate type of support. So if they've got intent, intent significant needs, like my dad went to rehab. He a, a, a community drug and alcohol treatment, um, community drug and alcohol service wouldn't have been sufficient to help him overcome his childhood trauma. He needed the intensity and the time that's involved when you go to a rehabilitation centre. And part of what facilitated his change was him being in the right place and the right service being available to him. And maybe there were certain people in and around him who were having conversations that were helping him understand how he ended up to become addicted to drugs and did he want a different kind of life for himself. And I do think that is a kind of conversation that we can have with parents. And then trying to function as a kind of bridge in some sense between where the parent is at, where they would like to be, and what kind of services might enable them to um, engage in that route and that path to overcoming some of those difficulties. Um, and then at the same time, um, we need to look at the, the support that we can offer the child, for example, as, as in my example, but also look at the, the family and the professional network, um, family group conferences, for example, and what, the, what we can do around the child and around the system to um, uh, ameliorate or reduce some of the risks associated with, with some of the behaviour. And I think sometimes I have to remind myself that it's not our job to eradicate risk. And, and to believe so is to place an insurmountable expectation and burden upon ourselves. Instead, our job is to lessen the risk sufficiently enough to enable children to be not exposed to excessively high levels of harm. And that's a kind of very different goal and, and, a, and a more achievable one, I think. Um, so some, some final thoughts. Um, in relation to how we deal with conflict within the work that we do. Um, uh, taking responsibility is, is, a, is, a, is a key part of it. Um, if, you take, if you break down the word response and ability, it's about the ability to choose your response. And so we can, what we have to do is develop principles of personally, within our work that means despite some of the difficulties that we'll come up against and despite some of the, um, the dissatisfaction and some of the way in which parents will project their pain and hurt onto us, that we, we, we take a stance that we're gonna still be compassionate in the face of that. Um, that we don't allow the, the, the circumstances to dictate our principles. Um, the, the second part is that the challenge is an opportunity, really. And I think some of the difficulties that, will ex that you'll experience working with parents is actually an opportunity for you to develop your character and your ethic about what type... It's, e it's relatively easy to be a nice person when people are being nice to you. The challenge and the test of your principles really comes under scrutiny when you're being screamed out and told to get the fuck out of my house. And so that's, it, it's about reframing some of these challenges as opportunities for, for personal and professional development. Um, Relationship-based social work, an insurmountable problem. Um, I suppose I just want to illustrate that there's a key challenge in social work. And, and I, it's a question, really. I think, it, is this an insurmountable problem? which is that one of the challenges is that we need to learn to separate um, the parents' frustration, upset, anger or hostility from, we need to separate that out from whether it's a result of our interpersonal approach with the parents or whether it's because we're a representative of a statutory organisation. Because if we fail to um, recognise that the parents' frustration or the hostility 
is a response to you being there as an agent of a statutory organisation, you'll take that personally. And actually, it may be that whoever was stood there in that moment in time, delivering the message that you unfortunately have to deliver at that moment in time, you might have experienced that type of response. But at the same time, you also have to realise that it may be something to do with the way in which you're functioning interpersonally. And you have to reflect about what was it that, how was it that I was being in that moment? And was there a way that I could have navigated and managed that kind of conversation differently that would have mitigated or reduced some of the, the, the conflict that emerged in that um, interaction? Um, and that's, a, that's an extremely difficult challenge, I think. Now, my response is to, to always work from the presupposition that the parent's behaviour, including their dissatisfaction, negative feelings towards me, is justified and reasonable from the context from which they're kind of situated in. And so whether a parent is um, frustrated and angry with me because of my role as a statutory social worker or because of my own interpersonal inadequacies, then I'll always attempt to not react defensively and recognise that their reaction is understandable from, from their perspective. And then I try and convey some empathy for their frustration, even if I'm not happy with it or in agreement with the reasons for their frustration, I can still show some empathy for it and then try and develop a further understanding of their, of their dissatisfaction. Um, the fourth point is around conflict being unavoidable. And I think no matter how sophisticated or skilled or relationship-based you are in the work that you do, there is unfortunately a reality that conflict is going to be unavoidable. If, you, if you're responsible for imposing the statutory duties of, of the local government, where there's risk of, you know, parents' children being lost, then, then you're going to come up against some difficulty. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that you're a bad person or not very good social worker if that's what you're coming up against and experiencing. Um, and then the, the, the final point is around supervision and peer support. This, this job, working in child protection, is extremely challenging, is extremely difficult. And day in, day out, a lot of my colleagues are um, endeavouring and, and attempting their best to be compassionate and um, consider and develop meaningful relationships in extremely difficult circumstances with some of the most traumatized members of our society. And so it's really important that you kind of acknowledge that, it, that and accept that it's gonna take its toll. It's gonna, um, you don't need to be ironclad in some sense, and that, but, but we need to find avenues in which to, um, to, to process some of those feelings because if you don't allow yourself space to acknowledge the negative effect that some parents' behaviour might be having on you, then you run the risk of it being suppressed or inhibited and projected into places that you don't want it to be projected. Um, there's a really um, great paper by Harry Ferguson on hostile relationships um, that, that, that I would highly recommend. Um, and he talks about that there's a kind of organisational investment in suppressing and inhibiting um, the emotions because they're quite difficult and uh, unbearable at times. And so it, it, we do need to try and call, we have a responsibility if you're a manager or if you're a colleague to try and look out for each other and support one another. Um, So um, a couple of concluding remarks. This is by uh, Rogers. We've talked a lot about empathy and the challenges of implementing that. And uh, I, I really, really love this quote. Minimal amount of empathic understanding, a bumbling and faulty attempt to catch the confused complexity of the client's meaning is helpful. So it's about, you, you, don't, you don't need to be, um, you know, several years qualified or have this specialist training or um, or to have this particular practice framework to, 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 to attempt to endeavour genuine curiosity in some of the challenges that parents are experiencing. Um, and parents are quite perceptive 
and, and are generally quite appreciative of your attempt to empathise with them, even if you are doing it in a slightly bumbling and, and, and um, kind of clumsy way. Um, and then the, uh, I think this is the last slide now, and this is The System Said Nothing by Alex Fox. And, and I'll just read this out to him and then share why I, why I like this. So the family said, the system will only help you when it's already too late. The social worker said, I came into this job to help people, but our systems get in the way. The manager said, we know we need to do things differently, but we have to work within the systems we have been given. The director said, we've got an exciting new vision for empowering people, but our systems take so long to catch up. The minister said, the first thing you learn in this job is how hard it is to change the system. But there was no system. The system said nothing. Now, the, re the reason why I, I like that is because in some sense, we are the system if you're within it. Um, Bridge Featherstone and her colleagues in their book, Protecting Children, said that if you, um, let me get this right. Every time an individual enacts practice in a particular way, what constitutes social work is constructed in that moment. And that to me is like a really kind of optimistic viewpoint. And I am an optimistic kind of social worker and, and, and believe that people can change if we provide the right support and the right levels of empathy. And I do believe in the power of individuals, the, the, the ability of each and every one of us um, to be able to make a difference. And, and just your minimal bumbling kind of attempt at being empathic in, in Roger's terms can tilt the system in favour of it being a more um, compassionate and considerate one. Um, so um, some, um, just some further reading and references. Um, there's a book that I read recently called Motivational Interviewing for Working with Children and Families by Forrester. It's the book I wish I had when I was a newly qualified social worker. And many of the ideas that I've talked about uh, are very closely aligned with what's encapsulated in that book. Um, and then there's a couple of others working with denied child abuse. Carl Rogers' work is always timeless and, and brilliant. Um, Social Work Theory by Siobhan McLean, Rob Harrison. They have that for practice educators and students. I just think everybody should have that. I haven't referenced it in this talk, but I just think it's a brilliant resource. Um, and then also I have a blog where I'm trying to explore some of these ideas. And I very much welcome further conversation and, and for you to join in with that. Um, so if... Um, so that's me finished. Thank you very much for, uh, for this opportunity and I'll hand it back to Siobhan and the team. Thank you so much, Richard. There's been um, so much feedback in the chat about um, how great the session has been. I think, um, I mean, the chat moves really quickly. I didn't know because I'm not normally looking at the chat. It moves so quick, but I heard, uh, so I can't, didn't catch who people were, but there were people saying that tonight has reignited their passion for social work because they've been somewhere for two days and it, and it killed off their passion, but tonight you've reignited it. So it has been an absolutely fascinating session and I, I've been jotting down loads of notes but something that struck me tonight Richard um, I don't know if if it's if it would be fair to say but I suppose my summary of it was you've talked a lot about empathy which is so important you've talked about the why which you know I talk about all the time which is so important but the thing that really came through for me was this thing about humility because you know you started off talking a bit about professional humility but I think you role modeled that for us through the session right from the start and all the way through I was just thinking about the need for humility in social work and how actually humility can often diffuse conflict anyway can't it so humility and conflict going together makes total sense for me but it's not something I would have come into expecting tonight so I'm taking that away it was fabulous 
So thank you so much for that, Richard. And uh, I've also seen that people are saying this was their first session and they would like to come back. So uh, the sessions we've got coming up are uh, dissertations and extended essays is next week. We've got Joe Finch coming and uh, Dylan Sloan as well. So both previous guests who are coming to talk about uh, your dissertations and extended essays and basically the end of your social work training, end point assessments. Then we're going to be doing social work in the menopause. Now, I think lots of people think, oh, I don't need to go to that if I'm not a middle aged woman like Siobhan is. Um, but actually, there's going to be some really interesting things there. And for me, that's an important one for everybody. And that will bring so many things that you don't think about in relation to social work that really matter. So that's uh, coming up on the 13th of October. And then on the 20th of October, we're handing over uh, again to a single guest, uh, Vivian, who is coming to talk about working with diversity and developing culturally sensitive practice. So uh, you should have the links in the chat to registering for all of those. I can see everybody in the chat talking about how useful tonight has been. So um, I think all it takes is for me to say thank you. I know the team are also wanting to say thank you, but I've got a different view than I normally have tonight, so I can't actually see the team. Um, I can only see uh, you, Richard, but everybody else I know uh, thought tonight was brilliant. So um, I don't know if you have any final thoughts that you want to share. Sometimes when I finish talking, I think, oh, I wish I'd said that. So it's always an opportunity if you have any final things that you wanted to share. Um, I don't think there were anything. There were there were no questions posed. There was lots of conversations in the chat. I think lots of interesting, um, in lots of different parts of what you've said. So we'll try and follow up with some links. Um, but if there's anything else that you would like to share, David, I'll, I'll leave the last word tonight over to you. Um, thank you Siobhan. Uh, the, the, the only last comment I would say is that um, I'd really appreciate using tonight's webinar as a, as a kind of a platform for a further dialogue and so I, I would love to hear from you and, and, and about what if there was any ideas that, that didn't quite fit or that you felt needed some kind of that, that could benefit from being constructed in a, in a different way uh, and, and I'd also just kind of highly recommend signing up to these to these webinars I, I've watched the vast majority of them and I've been in practice 10 plus years and I and I'm finding them extremely useful and it's and it's a real privilege actually to be a social worker and to have to ha and have access to this as a kind of resource um, so so thank you Siobhan and the team for, for, for everything and um, for having me here today thank you no, but the thanks all go to you, Richard. Thank you so much. So uh, thank you, everybody, for coming and hopefully we'll see you next week and goodbye. <laughs>